We still see this playing out today when we see the racial divide within the church. We label black and brown churches more style than substance simply because of the emotional expression without even listening to the potency of the messages actually being communicated. You're listening to As in Heaven, a Christian conversation on race and justice. In this episode, we're speaking with Jerome Gay on dominant and subdominant cultural dynamics. Now, if you're not familiar with those terms, don't worry, Jerome defines them very thoroughly and then breaks down how members of the dominant and subdominant culture groups can interact in an understanding way that promotes deeper love for each other and for God. Jim Davis is your host. Mike Aitchison is the co-host on this episode. Mike Graham is the executive producer of the show. My name is Matt Kenyon. I'm the technical producer. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode of As in Heaven with Jerome Gay. Well, welcome to As in Heaven, uh, season two. We are here today. I'm Jim Davis, joined by my co-host, Mike Aitchison over there. And we have the privilege of talking today with Jerome Gay out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. He is the lead pastor of Vision Church in Raleigh. is a gospel-centered, socially conscious, missionally-minded, disciple-making church. Um, you have, you may have heard him speak. You may have uh, read he some of his writings. He wrote um, "Renewal, Grace, and Redemption" in the story of Ruth, and he has just come out with his new book, "The Whitewashing of Christianity." Jerome, we are really thankful uh, to have you here today. Thank you for this opportunity. Really excited to be on the show. Excited to tackle some of these topics. So thank you for the, thank you for having me. Well, Jerome, uh, again, let me tag on and say thank you for coming on the show. You know, we pick. Uh, folks who are uh, subject experts in their field, and uh, but we also bring folks on who are very pastoral. And so we are grateful to have you on because you obviously have a firm grasp of this subject matter, but you come at it from a pastoral perspective. So uh, we're glad to have you on here to help us out with this discussion today. Uh, so uh, this uh, afternoon, we hope to unpack the realities and the nuances of dominant culture and subdominant cultures in America and how they relate to each other and how it affects our current cultural moment. So uh, let me just begin by defining two terms that will guide our conversation today. And those terms are dominant culture and subdominant culture. And I'll present our working definitions, but please feel free to push back as we think through this. Uh, so we define dominant culture as the majority culture in a particular society whose beliefs, customs, attitudes, values, and language are dominant. And then a subdominant culture is a minority culture in a particular society whose beliefs, customs, attitudes, values, and language are subordinate to the dominant culture. Yeah, I think that's great. I think um, as we unpack a little bit more, uh, I would only add that, you know, a lot of times when we talk about race, ethnicity, um, dominant culture can turn into being domineering. Um, I do think there's a difference. It, it doesn't automatically, uh, we can't automatically assume that, but the dominant culture, typically when we talk about issues of race and then the subculture being marginalize it's when the dominant culture becomes domineering and imperialistic as it relates to their culture and how it compares or is better than others uh, and as it relates to uh, sub sub dominant culture uh, sub is usually typically numerical meaning that the the number of people represented by a particular race or ethnicity or some type of group uh, they can be marginalized again depending on how they're treated by the dominant culture. So uh, I definitely like both of those definitions. Uh, that's a little nuance that I would add to it. No, that's good. Well, let's let, uh, let's continue that then. Let's talk about the differences between the dominant and some dominant cultures in America. Can you unpack some observations and cultural differences between dominant and subdominant cultures? Yeah, so I think a good example, um, so a couple of years ago, I wrote an article called Reform Theology versus Reform Culture. It's actually a, a chapter in my book as well. And in that, I, I bring up uh, Shoki Ko, who is a, a, a Asian minister who was mentioned in uh, Center Church, Tim Keller's book. And one of the things he, he unpacks is how his, his culture was, was encountering 
um, marginalization from the missionaries that will come. The, and and they, they, the missionaries were high in number and they begin to see their culture, the way they did things, the way they worship, the way they even, even in a Christian setting as better than. And so when we talk about some of these differences, uh, it becomes problematic when the dominant culture begins to say the way we do things, it's the way to do things. This is the right way to do liturgy. This is the this is the only way to pro- approach this homiletic, homiletically as it relates to preaching and the communication of the word of God. And so that that's that's some of the things I see. Uh, Robert Robert Romero also mentions this in Brown Church when he talks about the Latinx community and how just historically how Spaniards begin to kind of see their culture as better. And so 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 much so that some of some of the within the Latin community begin to embrace self hatred and want it to be. Uh, Christ no longer became the example, but the dominant culture. So depending on how it is applied, that's where we see kind of these differences in culture. One more kind of historical example, um, Christianity and culture. Uh, this thing, this book written about 50 years ago, they, they talked about how missionaries, uh, white missionaries in particular, saw that other cultures needed to be civilized before they could be evangelized. And we still, we still see this playing out today when we see the racial divide within the church. It's when we, we label black and brown churches more style than substance simply because of the emotional expression without even actually sometimes listening to the potency of the messages actually being communicated. So these are some of the, just, just a few, I want to kind of give some historical, some book references that kind of highlight some of these differences that we're still seeing now. Yeah, that, that's really, it makes me think of the old missionaries when they went out to Hawaii. One of the, 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 one of the first things they'd want to do is get them dressing like, like Europeans. And uh, which, w- yeah, which a- actually long-term did more harm than good by trying to change things about their culture. Well, can you speak to um, the way we view individualism versus like collectivism in dominant and subdominant cultures? Dominant, is there a difference in the way... Um, a dominant culture would view individualism versus uh, a subdominant culture would view individualism and collectivism. Yeah. What would, again, it, it kind of comes back to, you know, how one is uh, their life experience. So, so for instance, when we, we, we talk about the whole individualism versus collectivism, you know, typically, and we even see this in scripture when the Jews are a marginalized community, then they view things collectively. Um, God even does that in Joshua chapter seven, right? You know, all right. So Achan sins collectively, I'm addressing all of you. So we see this collectivism within scripture. Um, I would say individualism in some ways, I, I'm not painting with a broad stroke, but I think in many ways, it's somewhat antithetical just to the communal ethic of scripture. Uh, scripture tends to think communally, let us create man in our own image. There's, there's this now, there's two views in that verse, either it's Trinitarian or there's this divine council. However you view it, there's this group idea. There's a communal idea of that. And we, again, we, we see that in scripture in terms of the Jewish uh, community, the church. You know, there's this idea of this communal act. The book of Acts is communal. What God writes to the prophet, most of the time the word you, to use a country term, meant y'all right? It meant a group of people, right? It wasn't individualistic. So um, individualism, typically, I think the way this plays out in church or in the Christian settings seems to be more secularly conservative than it does to be Christian. And I think that's where we kind of get to the problem where there's a conflation of conservatism and Christianity and people begin to look at their rights well, Paul lays down his rights, you know, like the the, script, the the Christian ethic isn't about our individual rights. It's looking at the group. This is first Corinthians eight. So we see this throughout scripture. So I think that's where some of the differences come. It's easier for a marginalized community to think communally, because in many ways you have to when you're enduring oppression. Yeah, we we talked with Trevin Wax, and he was talking about how the normative Christian experience is on the margins, and so what we've experienced as a as a white Christian in America is it has been abnormal abnormal to the Christian experience, um, having having the the um, really the influence in society. 
And, uh, and he, he makes the case that we, as the white church, as the power is taking from us, because if you're going to hold a Christian view on sexual ethics and other things, marriage, you're, you're going to be pushed more on the margins. And the, the black church is really a place that we can and should look to historically over the past uh, couple hundred years uh, as, as what it looks like to live on the margins. And you just naturally need each other so much more when you're on the margins. You, you, you need each other. And so... Um, no, I appreciate that. How do some of these differences play themselves out at a societal level, more broadly speaking? Yeah, I think one another culture can be seen uh, as right as as opposed to cultural. So when when you make your cultural norms or rhythms or ethos right, then um, by contraindication you you demonize the the other culture. So this is I think this is really how when you study historically how we get things like the regulative principle. When you actually dig into stuff like that, you kind of find there's a lot of cultural influences. You even see this um, in approaches to scripture, like Matthew Henry's commentary on James. He he literally says that well, well James isn't talking about pew purchasing as it relates to favoritism. That's exactly what James was talking about. But because that was something happening in Matthew Henry's tradition, it affected even how what he put actually in, in his commentary on James. Right. So we, we see things like this happening because we elevate our culture over one another. Uh, another big thing is just how we process pain. Um, I know we'll kind of talk about some of the things happening in our society, but, you know, the black community often is, is told how to mourn. Um, this is how you need to mourn. This is this is stop being emotional, right? As if emotions are are bad. It's, it's almost this this idea as if God didn't create them. When Paul writes, "Be angry, but don't sin." Like it's okay to experience what you're experiencing. Feel the anger, feel the hurt, but don't let that lead you to to sin. Uh, or then, lastly, um, you know, it plays in how other cultures are labeled because they see injustice and want to do something about it, they're then labeled as liberal as opposed to being loving um, by the dominant culture oftentimes. Um, uh, David Swanson uh, has a book called Rediscipling the White Church uh, from Chief Grace to Solidarity. Um, and in that book, he, he covers some of that. Now, I, I think some ways he broad strokes, again, no book is to be taken wholesale. I don't think that was his heart. I think that's not his heart is unity because I read it from cover to cover. But again, he talks about how uh, typically how this is done in white, predominantly white churches and how they're how they view other other churches. Michael Emerson points this out in Divided by Faith in how surveying tons of predominantly white churches, many of which um, some of the people interviewed had never met a black person, but was able to diagnose what was wrong with black people. So <laughs> you don't have any relationship, but yet you know what's wrong. And that's part of the problem. When when you're in these homogenous settings, sometimes it's, it's real easy to elevate your culture as better as opposed to just different. I'm very interested if uh, you mentioned the way culture um, has impacted the regulative principle and the way that we understand that. Could you could you flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, I mean, this idea of music and or beat <laughs> or how, how things have to be done. That, that was inherently European, I mean, in, in terms of influence. And so what, what does that do to other cultures who will worship the same God, but worship him differently? And so when you put things like that in place and try to make it theological, because that's, that's the issue, is when you try to make something cultural, theological, in order to demonize those that disagree with you. And that's what's happening. That's, that's why we're still seeing this whole divide racially, as it relates to justice, how Marxism and critical race theory are thrown around way too loosely. Um, it's thrown around uh, just as loosely as the word racism. They say, well, you keep saying that you're diluting it. Well, we're diluting Marxism when, that, when it actually isn't Marxism because these things are thrown out. So that's, that's what I mean by that is it demonizes other cultures. If you don't do it this way, then you're unbiblical, not realizing that your premise isn't biblical. You don't have a biblical premise um, that's home hermeneutically faithful to come to the uh, to that idea. Uh, you, you know, Jerome, that's very helpful, and because in our space, a lot of times there's discussion about revivalism versus biblical worship, and I think, and I suspect that very often, folks uh, 
confuse cultural expression with what they quote unquote view as the negative side of revivalism. So, any there's a lot of suspicion about exuberance and excitement and any emotive actions in worship, and that's one of the things that that has concerned me as well. Where I think in the dominant culture, particularly in our context, people have certain blinders on, and they're very much unaware of how their culture is actually demeaning very helpful expressions uh, of another so- a portion of the body of Christ. Yeah, and I think it's limiting to, to essentially say you can, you can only worship God cognitively when we don't even see that in the Bible. Like we literally see them after getting on the other side of the Red Sea. We yeah. see what we call in our community a praise break. Uh, yeah, you, you 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 see a spontaneous, <laughs> you see a spontaneous. That's in the Bible. Miriam grabs a tambourine, right? You you see this in the Bible. Praise on it. So, but but see, what, what they what do they do? They try to they somehow it's different. How is it different? You know, so, somehow they 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 play what I call hermene- They do hermeneutical gymnastics to get to their own personal cultural conclusion. So again, to demonize in many cases is black and brown communities that may express. And again, not to say that, you know, white people don't dance or clap, but they do. Um, you know, so we're not going to paint white people with a broad stroke. But but again, oftentimes it's black and brown people, their, their expressions that are not somehow theologically inferior or unfaithful to scripture. It's like, hey, we, we see this in the Bible. Um, we see all of these expressions. In fact, there are more volitional, emotionally expressive expressions to salvation by grace. There's nothing else to be saved about. I mean, to be excited about. Why would you not be excited about salvation by grace through faith? What's wrong with being happy about unmerited favor? Um, It's funny. I see people respond more exuberantly to a sale at Target than they do the gospel. (laughs) <laughs> like when they get in church, somehow emotions got to be turned off. I, I, again, I just don't see that in scripture. Oh, well, you, as they say, you meddling now. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. <laughs> you know, you bring out a, a good point with how the culture, uh, you know, sort of impacts the exegesis. I, I, I realize this in part when I was reading through John chapter one, you know, light has come to the world, darkness has not overcome it. Depending on what commentary you read, some, and I know there's debate, uh, some understand that to mean darkness has not understood it, whereas others will, will actually see, and I appreciate Merrill Tenney, darkness has not overcome it. So they're behind, their, behind the idea of it is a spiritual battle. And that's, I think, another thing in our particular context where we're afraid to engage you know, the the spiritual forces or the spiritual warfare that's actually taking place behind a lot of things. And we try to over-rationalize it at times. Have you been seeing that or in, in your interactions? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, so, so there's credence for the phrase when we talk about race and these things, it's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. Agreed. But sin has names, right? We got 10 commandments with specific names of sin. So, murder, lying, stealing, racism. So calling something out um, by name doesn't, isn't antecedent or it shouldn't eclipse the gospel. Um, so yes, it is a sin issue, which will make it spiritual, right? But in, in that, again, um, culture kind of gets in the way of even how we approach these sin issues, because oftentimes, again, it's, it's seen through the lens of one culture and if that person doesn't acknowledge that they have one, then it's real easy to dismiss and wrongly mischaracterize and label those that disagree. Yeah. So um, as we think through some more specifics, how do some of these differences play themselves out in our current cultural moments as we you know, process and think through some of the high, more high profile moments like Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd? Yes, they can be seen as isolated incidents. But it's, it's too many names for it to be an isolated incident. And I do agree that facts matter. So don't hear me saying that we should immediately assign guilt to cops. I'm not saying that shooting officers firing back, sometimes it is justified. 
Um, but what we're talking about is unarmed people, you know, and the, the, the issue I take oftentimes um, is that people claim total depravity, but I've heard well-known, more reformed theologians say that police brutality isn't a thing. And my retort is, well, then you don't believe in total depravity, because if it's total, it can play out in any way. That would include a white man in a blue suit with a black gun pointed at a brown man. That doesn't mean that all cops are bad. That's not painting all white people. What we're saying is because we do understand that total depravity because of the fall, that it will play out and there would be no sin that can't happen as a result of our world being totally depraved, but not without hope because we have Yeshua as our savior, as our hope, as the image of the invisible God. So uh, that that's that's one. There's a lack of empathy, I think, where, you know, f- you know, facts over feelings. I, I hear Ben Shapiro quoted more than I do scripture. And that's problematic where, you know, this this Jewish guy uh, is is quoted as kind of a, a mark of what what Christians should look towards as opposed to scripture itself. We're so, we are supposed to mourn with those to mourn and bear one another, bear one another's burdens. And I think th- this is kind of more controversial one is they're not allowing, we have to allow nuance for Black Lives Matter, the sentiment versus Black Lives Matter, the organization. And I tell people, listen, I, I will affirm the sentiment as an anthropological and theological truth because black people and brown people and all people are made in the image of God. I do not affirm the organization. I've read their core values. I've seen the statements on the attack of the nuclear family. I've seen the cisgender comments, but it's not unbiblical to to co-opt a term. Paul does this in Acts 17, verse 28. In him, we live and move and have our being as some of your poets have said. So Paul, I think it's Epimenides, I think is the one, yeah, Epimenides is the one he's quoting. This, so, so here's Paul co-opting a term and applying it to the real God. So I think for us to say that you can't co-opt a term or remix a term to provide redemptive value to it, again, is inconsistent. Uh, but again, these are, these are some of the things that happen. It's like, well, don't say that, or, or, or because you say that, you somehow embrace everything to do with the organization. And I'm saying that's just, is, is it logical? And we have to allow, you know, grace and nuance in how we approach and realize we all do have blind spots. And if we do, and we only, and we only talk to the same people, we nurture our delusion about each other as opposed to moving towards unity. You know, Jer- Jerome, I- I'm glad you mentioned that bet- uh, about BLM distinguishing between organization and sentiment. I'm honestly, brother, of the persuasion that Christians actually need to be more vocal about the statement than the organization itself, because that is a claim that belongs to our worldview in the truest and fullest sense of the word. So if we're out front, that would dismantle, that would that would disarm their ability to make the claim that we don't actually care. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think we should be more vocal than them about it. Yeah, I agree. Agreed. And, and you know, I, I I did some posts just saying, yeah, I mean, I, I affirm this is a theological truth. It's an anthropological truth. It's a creative order truth. It's a biblical truth. And so I'm going to say it. And I'm I'm not going to be silenced because just because I'm saying that, and you have them on tape saying that we're trained Marxists. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not. <laughs> that we 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 it's here's here's the hypocrisy. And I and I want to say this lovingly, right? So the argument is don't group white people together, right? But then you do it to black people by saying a phrase. Because you said this phrase, you're now grouped in with the organization just by saying the phrase. So there's duplicity there when it's like, okay, hey, allow us nuance, but then you're not giving this same nuance that you want for your for your community to the black and brown community. And I'm saying that's that's where, yeah, I'm I'm going to say it. I encourage people to say it. And again, just like anything else, 
you know, there, there has to be nuance. Uh, when Trevin Wax was on the show, he, in kind of a cheerleader kind of way, he said, church, we can do this. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. This is this nuance. We can do this. And he wasn't, he wasn't coming down on people. He was saying, we got this. We can do this. I, what I really appreciate about the way that you answered that is how you worked in total, total depravity. So if anybody doesn't know what total depravity is, it's the doctrine that, that every faculty of our being is ravaged by sin. It doesn't mean we're as sinful as we could possibly be. We can all be worse. But, but every faculty that we have is ravaged by sin. And so if organizations are made up of people and systems are created by people, why would we think if we hold a total depravity that that wouldn't affect uh, all these areas? So I, I appreciate you pointing that out that you're speaking about um, police, but it, it would be true of everything, including our own church, everything. All right, so let's kind of a similar question, but we go a different way. How do how some of these differences play themselves so, out uh, in the ways in which members of the subdominant culture experience churches that largely reflect the dominant culture? Yeah, so the, again, terminology becomes weaponized, right? So we, we, we talked about you know how Paul use the phrase co-opted it, then applied it to the, the one true God. He applied it to Yahweh. Um, and and we, we've seen this historically, the, the, the concept of narcissism comes from Freud. Freud was not a Christian. Um, therapy, you know, we, we, we begin to embrace things that start in a secular arena, and then we see some human value, and the church has largely embraced. There's historical precedent for this. Um, but again, it we black people feel marginalized when it's like, it, how, how come when it comes to us, w- we have to literally fight to matter? Like the the comedian Michael Shea, he said, "All we saying is we can't even get matter." <laughs> he said, we, "We we we can't even get matter. Like really, we got to fight to matter, right?" So so that's you know so literally like. It's interesting that people will are more vehement about responses to racism and injustice than they are actual injustice. Um, and that's that's what we feel. The the whole critical theory and critical race theory, um, we're then labeled automatically assumed, we're we're assumed to embrace all these things wholesale. And I think we we have to allow nuance or what JP Moreland calls conceptualized integration where, it, it, you know, there's this idea of, I, I mean, there are things that may, maybe the phrase came from a hashtag in 2013 as a result of Trayvon Martin. Um, and, and again, these are three lesbian women, well, I think two of them are lesbian, um, the three women who started, started BLM. Um, but just because the source, the, the source may not, uh, doesn't agree with us theologically, it doesn't mean that every single thing that the person says needs to be rejected. Again, that's what Paul is doing. He's saying, yeah, this phrase is great. Y'all just applying it to the wrong person. So let me show you this. So this phrase, I'm going to take this, and, and, and you, you guys are polytheistic, you guys are pagan, but I'm going to take this phrase, and I'm going to show you who it really applies to. So that, that's, that's the thing I think many black and brown people are saying, is like, guys, like, why do we have to go through all of these hoops just for you to care? And, and that's, that's, that's the feeling. And in many cases, that's the experience. Well, that's a good, I, I was good biblical perspective and high altitude perspective, but I want to ask you to get really specific here. What are some common mistakes that churches make in misunderstanding this? And really from the dominant side. Yeah. Well, well, well I think, you know, trying to get, trying, bringing on a black person for racial diversity and then not listening to him or her. That's a huge mistake. So you bring this person, number one, they can't represent the entire black community. Number two, they're not going to fix your church's race problem in two years. Um, you know, sadly, that's usually the time they're given before they're fired. Uh, and, I, and I've had s- tons of people who they come in with this position and, you know, you, they, you're going to help us. But then they just, as they begin to make suggestions and say, hey, how, how can we think about this? We can do this differently. They're met with resistance. So like, what was the point in hiring that person? If you're not going to give them a voice at the executive table, that which leads to another one, not having a real, any real authority, not giving them a voice at the executive table, not having diverse. Now, let me say this, because, again, people try to mischaracterize my statement. Um, I'm not saying make a guy an elder because he's black, but if he's qualified, if he meets the biblical qualifications of First Timothy 3, First Timothy 5, Titus, um, 
then, you know, getting some diverse voices who, who meet the biblical qualifications at the executive level and let them have real authority to speak into these things. So these are some of the issues. And then um, you got to be willing to lose people. Uh, the, the pastors are you're going to find that a lot of your members are more conservative than Christian. And again, I say this in love, but we have to have these honest conversations. They're more they've given more into secular while they're talking about critical race theories. They're more secular conservative than they are biblical Christians. And you'll see that once you begin to tr- pr- pursue biblical unity and justice. And when you pursue that, they'll just it's easier for them to label you because confronting this is is going to ruffle feathers. And I've seen, you know, my white brothers and I've seen uh, I've seen them lose people. I've, I've seen them be labeled Marxist. And they're like, man, I, I never even read the Communist Manifesto. Like, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. But they're they're quickly labeled um, just for trying to su- pursue biblical justice and love. So th- those are a few. If you want some more, you know, let me know. Well, I would like <clears throat> there's a phrase that you hear a lot. And I'd like you to kind of. Um, explain for us the phrase is we we want your color but not your culture when what what does that mean and how, how would you explain that to someone maybe who's not even familiar with the term the phrase yeah so that what, what happens with that is you you want black faces but you don't want black voices so outside of singing right so we can entertain um but again we're not we're not offering anything else other than that or that person is marginalized to, to theory uh, to issues of race but then they can't speak about pneumatology, ecclesiology, um, hermeneutics, homiletics, as if that, that, that person only serves either, either in entertainment or a racial purpose. Uh, the, the cultural element is, uh, again, we might, be, we might get on the stage to sing, but we're not at the decision-making table. So that's, that's what uh, Black people mean when they're at these predominantly white churches, and that's the experience. It's like, yeah, you want my face to be able to check your diversity box but you don't really want the essence of who I am. You don't want what I bring. You don't want my experience. You don't want my challenge. Like I, I need to be able to challenge you without being fired. Right. And so the, the, these are the things that, these are some of the things that we're talking about when we say you, you want our color, but you don't really want our culture. One of the things that it seems to come up in every episode is just the value of listening. Just, just really listening, not not listening so that you can come back at him, but really listening and understanding standing in the role of just Christian empathy in this whole conversation. So I want to listen to you for a moment. Um, we, I want to understand how you feel when I ask this question. What would be some things that you would want the dominant culture members to know about what it's like to be a member of the subdominant culture? Yeah, well, well again, in a well, number of several, but one is. I don't want to, black people don't want to talk about race all the time. Um, we're put in situations where we have to, you know, like when I was, I was, I've been racially profiled, you know, um, in, in a place called Cary, North Carolina. I've experienced that. My daughter was told by another student. Uh, my parents taught me not to like brown people. Um, I can't skip that conversation. So the, the, the idea that we want to talk about race, no, we're forced to. Um, and we're and oftentimes we're not the ones bringing it up. We're acts. We're brought into these conversations. So that that's one. It's like there there are way up, there are a lot of other topics that I read, I study, I have interest in. But my experience in America often forces me. Um, number two, we, we don't teach our kids that black is a strike. We teach them that other people view view it as one. And so we, we, we have to say, you know, we have to teach our children these things. Like, listen, I, I tell my, my daughter, and my son, like, your black is not a strike. God made you the color. He wanted you to be that color. But because of sin, other people will view it that way. I want to make sure you never view it that way. It's beautiful because black is beautiful because it's biblical. Um, because the creator thought of this. And he chose to have many different shades of melanin. And some have more than others. But this is all a part of his mosaic of creation that, um, you know, these, that, that talking about an issue doesn't make you a race baiter or it doesn't make you a, a person that's always given into victimization. We have to realize that there are real victims. Um, was George Floyd perfect? Absolutely not. But was he a victim? Yes. Was Breonna Taylor uh, a, a victim? Yes. You know, the, the, they're real victims. And so, when all of these cliches or political terms are used, 
it comes across as extremely unloving, unbiblical. Um, it's hard to feel like family when this is what you're getting from the dominant culture. Uh, and they claim the doctrines of grace. And they and, and it's interesting that our, our what separates Christianity from other religions is grace. But that grace is often not extended to black and brown people by the dominant culture. And that's what they need to know. And so having these conversations, listening. And when I say listen, I mean both sides. It can be mutually edifying when both of us actually listen, not just a black person talking, but that we actually, you know, listen to listen to each other. So again, I got a ton, man, but we don't have time. But that's uh, those are a few. I hope that's helpful. Jerome, th- th- thank you for sharing. Uh, and, and yes, we know that one question alone we could dedicate. Uh, it's just a whole lot of time to that. Um, to that, and along the same lines, what would you say to someone from the dominant culture who struggles to under, um, who struggles, excuse me, to understand why it is beneficial to the advancement of the gospel to seek understanding, knowledge, and wisdom about these matters? Yeah, um, be, because there's an evangelistic element to to unity, which is why. Paul rebukes Peter. And keep in mind, Peter is the one who had the Acts 10 experience Mm -hmm. of, oh man, okay, I can treat, you know, I'm not going to call what God calls clean unclean, right? He he has this, has this experience. But even after that, Galatians 2, right? And so, and so Paul has to rebuke him. And he says, listen, man, your, your xenophobia is contagious, and you got Barnabas kind of going astray. And what does he say? He says it, it, it wasn't just the racial or the cultural component, how you, however you want to view that verse. He says he wasn't in step with the gospel. The, the, this is what Paul gospel. said. Mm-hmm. He says he's not in step with the truth of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's what we, this is why it's beneficial to be in step with the truth of the gospel. We seek unity, not only within homogenous settings, but if, if, if uh, diversity is within reach, and I get, I get, you know, some states are dominated where it's not a lot of diversity. So I don't think we make this a prescription. But if if you have the opportunity, I think the scriptural ethic would be to pursue that, to pursue someone different than you who thinks different than you, and maybe even vote differently than you, and seeing where you can meet common ground. Because again, the world is watching. We have a world watching. And we don't want the world leading in diversity uh, and engagement more than the church. Our mission is to glorify him. And in doing so, we depopulate hell. But when we're not unified and we say we have the important message, we're, think about this. This is the claim we're making, that there's only one way for 7 billion people in the world. That's the claim Christians are making. And I'm one. So this is the claim I'm making. How can I make this claim and not be able to to defend my position and then not have unity with people who claim to have the same position? This 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 is the problem. Like again, the the world is watching, and it is a bad witness when we rather talk about critical race theory than we do uh, people who are dead, and many of which may may spend eternity separated from God. Like like this, we're, we're missing. We're missing the core message. Uh, Jerome, I think it's something you, you touch on something so important. And I just all the way from Acts 1 all the way up to the council, Barnabas is involved in seeing the Jerusalem church expand. He sells his property. He's involved with the expansion of the church at Antioch. And then you get to Acts 15 and Peter comes around. Right. So he, he ends up saying, OK, we can't keep going in this direction. We got to get out of the way of God. The Gentiles are included in this plan. I think that's something that's important there for us to see that a racist repented. And so if, in fact, you do struggle with racism, the cross is big enough for that as well. So to just simply say that racism does not exist does not do you any good if, in fact, you are struggling with racism. Right. Yeah, because because then you never confront you never confront the issue. And, and, and what I love about, you know, also in uh, Acts 15, right, who, who's one of the ones that speak up? James. Mm-hmm. James speaks up, and then he's the one who writes, no partiality. That's right. No favoritism. So, so, James, so, so James, who's at this council, 
then writes again, hey, guys, I was there. I saw the damage this could have done if we didn't get this right. So, so let me make it clear. Don't show any partiality. And that's how I define racism biblically is it's the, it's the sin of partiality that we see in the book of James is, and you know, it, it can be class, but obviously it, it can be race. So, so yeah, thank that. Uh, that's, that's definitely a huge point, man, that there's, you know, racist uh, can, can repent. So Crawford Loritz said the same thing when he was with us. He talked about the sin of partiality. Um, and I think it's interesting as you're, as you're talking, I'm thinking about, uh, I've been, I was overseas doing mission work for about five years and I interact with missionaries of all different theological stripes and all of us, whatever our theological background, um, all of us went into this culture looking to, because we wanted the gospel go forward, we wanted to learn about that culture and in many ways uh, assimilate and under, we didn't ask them to become like us. We sought to look like them. And so I, it, as you're talking, I'm thinking, we as Christians could learn a lot from our missionaries because of the way that they understand and listen and culture and um, put the gospel before a value of them assimilating to us. Um, all right, I want to shift now and talk about the internal dynamics between uh, different subdominant groups. So we've talked previously and discussed on the show, uh, I think it was Daryl uh, Williamson's episode, about the ways in which we know that black people are not monolithic despite having a number of common ex uh, experiences and challenges. We understand there's a spectrum in all that and there's a bell curve in terms of, of how people process a wide variety of things. So how do factors like timing, location, and origin of your ancestors uh, affect people of, uh, people of color in the subdominant culture? Well, well, a lot of ways. Um, when 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 you talk about, you know, I guess ancestor origin and and, and that sort of thing, um, I, I think there's a geographical element um, when you talk about the experiences of Black people in the South versus the experience of Black people in the North, where we we got to get rid of the you know the misinformation as if racism didn't exist in the North even during the Great Migration, it did. Um, but what what I found is, you know, being from Washington, D.C. Um, and living in PG County, this is one of the wealthiest black suburbs in America. So I'm used to seeing black people in power, black people leading schools, leading. I did an internship at Freddie Mac um, and most of the a lot of people in power were, were black. So it gives me this framework to think beyond what culture is telling me. America is telling me. I'm good for either basketball or rap or sports or rap. When you get to see principals, CEOs, SVPs of businesses, entrepreneurs, and you see this, then it reminds you, it lets you know that there are other avenues, there are other options. Um, when I moved to, we, so we, <laughs> we went from DC, Chocolate City to Junction City, Kansas. You, you, you can't talk about a different place. <laughs> Literally, and I'm not exaggerating, my first day, I'm talking about moving. We're with the truck, we're moving. I go out just to take a little break from lifting stuff. And uh, this kid gets nose to nose to me and says, you listen here, nigger. This here's my neighborhood. I haven't been in Kansas a full day yet. Um, and, you know, and this is before I was saved, so... I punched the kid. Um, that's what happened. Uh, after I beat the kid up, we get a bang on the door. I open the door. It's, it's a big black guy with the kid who just called me a nigger behind him. It's his stepdad. He said, why you beat up my son? I said, your son called me a nigger. He looked back at his son, closed, closed our door, <laughs> had to go deal with him. My point is sharing that story, right? It's just my it, my experiences there versus the more, and I know Kansas is more Midwest, so, you know, but but even here in North Carolina, I've experienced those things. I experienced stuff from teachers in Kansas where I was frequently accused of stealing when I didn't, of bullying when I wasn't by the teachers. So it's just important that you know we we understand like these claims are not just when we're adults there's residue of race, racism or prejudice 
um, throughout that. And let, and let me say this real quickly because uh, you had mentioned it. One, one thing I say here is hold it. Hold it up there a little longer. Let, let, yeah, I'm sorry. For anybody so, watching. Yeah, I mean, most people are listening. So, so people are listening. Tell them what you're holding That's up. That's right. So this is my book, The Whitewashing of Christianity. Then there's a subtitle, A Hidden Past, A Hurtful Present, and A Hopeful Future. And I put that subtitle because I know many will judge a book by its cover. The book is not a white bashing book, um, but it, it is dealing with the effects of uh, the effects of white supremacy, one of them being whitewashing and, and presenting Christianity with a broad white stroke. Um, but, but anyway... One of the things I say in the book is we do need to think of race in a spectrum. There's racial ignorance. That's first. That's not knowing because of proximity. There's racial indifference. This is when we kind of don't care whether we're in homogenous or diverse settings. Then there's racial insensitivity. And this is when we could care less. And we'll say jokes, we'll say things about another culture without any conviction. Then there's racism, which is willful hatred. And the reason I think we need to think on the spectrum is so that we don't label the ignorant a racist. And and it's it's through these experience, experiences with each other. And I talk about it more in the book, but that's how we can actually grow in understanding someone like me who's had these from Southeast D.C. I grew up in the hood, but through these different experiences, God has shown and taught me a lot. And this is the story of many black people. And last thing I'll say about it is, you know, we're black people often accused of being, yeah, I just want to be victims. No, what's what's ignored is our triumph. There were literal laws against us reading, laws against us voting, redlining, keeping us from getting loans. And we've still gotten houses, started businesses, started schools. So it's, it's amazing that people talk about black victimization, but ignore black excellence. Jerome, I, I appreciate you expressing that. O- over the past couple of years, I've been trying to engage that more intentionally. I just got tired of seeing black men in particular become persona non grata in movies. I mean, you know the common joke, who's going to be the first one to die? It's the brother, it, w- without, without fail. And want to get eaten by the shark. <laughs> even though even though they don't think we swim <laughs> you know I, I think it was uh, Jada Kiss may have said why did you know Denzel have to why, do training day before the award and the Oscar right and so even though he's making Oscar money before that I, I got frustrated even with movies that were uh, depicting the black family, black culture, that black men were were being seen as the thing to avoid. And so I watched a movie with, I think it was when Idris Elba was the hedge fund manager. He was married to Beyonce. And he pulls up an opening scene in this S550 uh, Benz. And I was thinking, I was so excited and I couldn't understand. I said, man, why did that excite me so much? And it had dawned on me how frustrated I was over the years of black men being typecasted. And finally, here we have in a movie a mainstream movie where a black guy is being elevated. So I so appreciated that. And recently I was listening to Dr. Howard Dotson. Uh, he just uh, retired from the Schomburg Center up there in New York. And he was talking about rebranding the black narrative as well. He said, it's not just one of a struggle. It is a story of overcoming, right? Not just because of the system, but despite the system. So that's something that we need to unearth more of and, as well. And, and it's important, uh, Michael, that this isn't missed. It was because of our understanding of the sovereignty of God. Yes. When you go back, like like I think, and, and this is one one other thing, and I'll stop talking about the book, but you know, many of these because, church, many of these church fathers were African. Yes. They were African. Augustine, Athanasius, Irenaeus, Cyprian, Shenouda of a Treat. Th- these are perpetual and felicity, African women martyrs, female martyrs. Like th- these people, now, now the imagery doesn't reflect that. And that's a problem. Mm-hmm. But when you, when you study this, and even though, even when you read the slave narratives, when they were able to sneak and read, they knew a difference between what the slave master said and what the Bible actually said. And they saw hope in the story of Exodus and they saw hope in, 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 in scripture. And this was a part of our triumph is our understanding of the sovereignty of God. 
And so it's not that the slave masters tried to beat Christianity. Christianity was in Africa before it was in Europe. They tried to beat inferiority and they were unsuccessful. And that, and that, and that's, that's what's it's important that we understand that that theological heritage that we have, because oftentimes that's ignored and, and we don't get credit or credence for that. Listen, Jerome, you, you are speaking my language. Before before they could even read or write, they they had already crafted remarkable theology about the bigness of God. Oh, well. So uh, let me uh, move on to ask you another question. So broadly speaking, we have African descendants of slaves, Afro Caribbean, African American, and Afro Latino, and some of these groups have um, some of these groups come from dominant cultures more recently, and some have been subdominant for hundreds of years. How does that affect the way they are going to see our cultural moment? Well, it, it depends on who they're received by. Um, so I, I've seen some Afro-Latino or full Latino uh, and tend to, and I'm putting this in quotes, side more with the dominant culture based on their experiences and who, who discipled them, who shaped them. So Sometimes, you know, and, 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 I, and I tackle this, you know, one, one of the things when we talk about Black not being a monolith, you know, th- there are people within the same community who give some of the same more secular conservative talking points about other Black people. And we, we have to also realize that depravity can take on the form of self-hatred mm-hmm. to where you have a disdain for people of your own ethnicity your own race, your own culture, because you've been discipled by a dominant culture to see your own culture as less than. Mm-hmm. And so that's how that can play out uh, in some ways to where there are going to be different approaches on the Ahmaud Arbery's, the Beyonce Taylor's, the Trayvon Martin's, the Eric Garner's, the, you know, the Walter Scott's and the Charleston Nine. Again, all of these names, right? So you're you're gonna you're going to see that, and then there are going to be again theological differences, to where um, talking about justice, uh, talking about racism, talking about these things, based again those subgroups you talked about, it has a lot to do. At the end of the day, it is a discipleship issue, and if you're discipled in a more conservative evangelical. When I say conservative, I don't mean biblically. I mean politically with with a little scripture thrown in, then you'll you'll take on that if you're not careful. And you're going to see groups um, uh, with, within those different groups you just mentioned, you'll see those differences even amongst those groups. That's really helpful. We uh, I, I want to shift for this last question. I know you've written and you've spoken, you've made videos about what some people call urban apologetics. And I have, I have black pastor friends, one of them sitting right over there. Um, and, and I've come to understand that, especially in black communities, um, a lot of the the questions they're asking, it's not the validity of the Bible. Can I trust the Bible? They're not your classic apologetic questions. They're asking things like, is Christianity only a white man's religion? So as someone who's written on this and made videos about this, uh, can you unpack what a per- uh, urban apologetics is and how it differs from the questions that we read in most of the apologetics books that, that we read from anywhere from Lifeway to Seminary? Yeah, so it's important to understand that when we talk about urban apologetics, we, we're talking about the cultural, theological, uh, social, financial, and existential concerns of people of African descent. The primary one is existential. And so when you talk about, look, we're not talking about the validity um, of God's existence. It's more so when we bring up the whole white man's religion thing, this is why I call my book The White Washington Christianity because there's an existential question that many black and brown millennials and other age groups are asking. And that, uh, that is, does Jesus even like black and brown people? Did he use anyone that looks like me in scripture? Has he used anyone that looks like me in history? And when we look at, and this is sad, when we look at the images, and, and I, I, I got my master's in 2016, so it wasn't that long ago. Literally, all of the images of the African church fathers were white. All of the images of Jesus in my books were white. All of the images of the Jewish people were white. All of the images of the New Testament church were white. So 
you have to realize that unsaved people seeing this and reading some of these things are making the not unfair conclusion that God only used white people and that God wants to save you, um, but he won't use you as a part of his redemptive plan. And so they're asking this existential question, is this guy really care about me? Did, did, did God use anyone that looked like me? Because what our seminaries, our more reformed, sadly, the seminaries are functionally saying, and I'm not saying that they're all racist, but what they're functionally saying is, well, God only used white people. Jesus was white, 12 white disciples. You might get Samson. Uh, you might get Samson with dreads. But then we get who I affectionately call Pantene Pro V Jesus with the hair and the immaculate beard, uh, white, white guy. So all of this white imagery is communicating something to people. So the urban apologist has to deal with their existential concerns. We have to deal with these questions. And then we have to go back and say, Hey, um, and, and here's, here's the challenge, right? I have to apologize for, for my more reformed, predominantly white seminaries and say, this imagery is not accurate of the history. Th- this is not. So then I have to make that apology to try to deal with their concerns. Again, ultimately get to the gospel, because I'm not saying that recognizing that uh, Christianity was in Africa, that doesn't save, but that's a valid concern in order for me to be able to get to the message that does say, which is the gospel. And so that's what we deal with. And we confront what's known as BRICS, which are black religious identity cults and RICs, white religious identity cults. You know, KKK was considered a Christian spiritual organization. The Hebrew Israelites, um, again, will be primarily a black religious identity cult. And they're a, they've been able to successfully tap into those existential concerns. But the issue is that they blackwashed the Bible. Like my book is not saying we don't address whitewashing by blackwashing. Uh, And I say this, the issue is not the inclusion of white people. It's the exclusion of black and brown people as it relates to imagery. And so the urban apologist has to deal with those concerns. Does God. So the shooting of unarmed black people, that's a question of theodicy. Like, like this is missed in urban settings. Like, no, that's a question of theodicy, the problem of evil. Why is God allowing this to happen? You know, Habakkuk, again, didn't he wrestle with that? He's asking God, how long do I have to? So we see in scripture, but again, when black people ask these questions, we're often marginalized. So the urban apologist is saying, I can't ignore these people because they're lost. And it seems like the traditional apologetics does not care. And again, I'm saying it, it comes across this way. I'm not, I don't want to make a heart um, assumption, right? But it comes across that they don't care about black and brown lostness. And so urban apologetics is saying, we want to deal with these concerns. We want to speak a language you're going to understand. And again, we want to get you back to Yeshua, who can save. Uh, it's, it's just so sad to, to think, obviously, there's lots of gospel implications uh, when we talk about racism, but just that racism itself causes people to not want to associate with the gospel, to question the validity of the gospel, to question Jesus himself. I mean, this is a gospel issue at every corner, and, and especially in black communities, it, it affects the advancement of the gospel. Jerome, man, I just can't thank you enough for what you're doing. I look forward to buying your book and reading it. I am going to as soon as I can, and uh, and I hope our, our listeners will as well. We're thankful for the work you're doing in Raleigh um, and, and really all around the nation. Thank you for giving, you, giving us so much of your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed myself, guys. For more interviews, resources, and discussion questions based on the content you've heard, go to asinheaven.com. That's A-S-I-N-H-V-N.com. If you liked this episode, please take a second to give us a five-star rating on iTunes, which you can do right from the Apple Podcasts app if you're listening there, or take a second to share it with a friend. Thanks again for listening.